Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out tonight. Those of you who are watching and listening online, thank you for joining us as well. For those of you who are in the room with us, we of course have a post-program social hour. We're gonna have some great food, drink, and some entertainment. So stick around for that. Quick housekeeping, if you have any noise-making devices, I don't know, does anyone have pagers anymore? Uh, silence it. If you've got a cell phone, please put it on uh, vibrate. Um, and uh, other than that, there are some question cards spread throughout the room. Throughout the program, if you have a question, write it down. We'll have someone come and get the cards and bring them up to us toward the end of the program. And uh, if you don't get your question asked, don't worry. During the reception, you'll have a chance to talk to all of our speakers and uh, it'll be a good time. So thank you very much. Let's get set and we're gonna get started with a short video about Michelle Miao's show. Being trans did not, as I feared it would, keep me from you know this dream i had like and so what i would say to anyone especially you know people with trans people in their lives people who are trans and early in their transition is that this doesn't close off anything anything you've wanted to do you can still do and probably do better at um as as a trans person than than you could in the closet and so you know just just go for it and the language that i learned was that men were more valuable than women simply because they were men. That was the culture I was in. That was the environment. And, you know, by my father knocking my mother out, I was like, hey, man, it's, it's your way or the highway. There is no other. You are the boss. And I get it. You would rather be feared than loved. On Thursdays, which the, was the night that Will and Grace was on, I would drive carpool for my 13-year-old daughter. And I um, would pick up, you know, four, uh, three other kids, and we'd be on their way to school. And invariably, one of the kids would say to me, what's on Will and Grace tonight? And I knew that this show was being watched by kids before they had a precondition of what there, you know, of, of gay people. Of course, my transition was mid-career. When I came out in 2002, 2003, um, so to speak, I had seen how the other half lived. So transitioning, you know, and being worried and being in my own headspace as far as like, I'm the first trans woman to even attempt to do this. My own mother said I'm going to have to leave sports and and like I'm I'm not going to leave sports until somebody makes me. I'm going to keep trying and see how it works out. I don't know that it can't do it. It's this is not oppression Olympics. This is not like what about the what about -ism? This is about us sitting together, having real conversations, showing up every day and making sure that we're doing the best that we can to fight on an individual level. Racism is inter institutional and interpersonal. You have to fight it from all sides and it takes everybody everywhere. So I would ask the same person, what are you doing to have conversations in your community to make sure that this is not being perpetuated? Who are you talking to that doesn't look like you? Who's coming to your dinner table? I love asking white people, when's the last time you had a black person over for dinner? They're like, I am looking forward to Asian American mediocrity in that <laughs> not everything has to matter so much, right? That we have to put it in this book that's so special. And like, what if like Asian Americans could just be comfortable with like what we're doing now? And, uh, and climate change is now the, the biggest threat and the biggest uh, economic uh, uh, threat to all of us uh, with temperatures like 100, I read 122 in India recently. Uh, we're all feeling the effects of uh, climate change. What I learned of surviving out here in these streets, it ain't what you know, it's who you know. I feel like for us to continue to work together and remember that one community cannot thrive without the other. If one of us is suffering and one of us, of us is being oppressed, all of us are being oppressed. So ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Miao and our speakers.
Thanks for that. You should click her. Okay. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for our last program of the year. I know it sounds so definitive and so final, but we'll be back next year and we'll do more programs and and welcome to our annual uh, Michelle Miao Show end of the year program. And tonight I'm so honored and so proud that we're having a serious discussion. I know, you know, sometimes you wanna end on a high note and I promise you, I think at the end, we are gonna end on a high note. San Francisco has been at the forefront in terms of being able to take care of one another. And I think that the, that you know, we're remarkable in a lot of ways in which we pull together as a community to ensure that taking care of each other means a whole lot more than a hashtag. <laughs> so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us online and here in person. Let me introduce to you our speakers tonight. We've got Antoine Matthews who's with Code Tenderloin. We've got Craig Ruski who's with Renegade Bio. Alexis Petra, Dr. Alexis Petra, I should say, with Transclinique, mm -hmm. and Dr. Monica Gandhi, who many of you who have been here at the club will know, has been a recipient of our Distinguished Citizen Award, but she is with UCSF. So let's give a big round of applause for all of our speakers. Well, you know, um, we've talked about it a whole lot, but the pandemic and COVID-19 surely has done a number on all of us. Uh, one of the big questions that I have when it comes to long-term illnesses such as HIV AIDS, how has that impacted our community? We focused a whole lot on COVID-19, but what happened to our community during that time? So I'll open up with Dr. Monica Gandhi and asking you, uh, and the rest will follow in their their answers with their respective work. <clears throat> but like, what has been going on with HIV AIDS in the last few years, especially since 2020? Yeah, so um, really nice to be here. And we have had some setbacks and I think it would be really important to talk about them so that we can work on them. And essentially, you know, if we think about, <clears throat> sorry, is it, it looks like, it went forward and then it stopped going oh, forward. There we go. Ooh, now it's going forward a lot. <laughs> okay, let me go back. So, um, you know, there's sort of the global pandemic and then there's the local US epidemic with HIV. So if we look at COVID and HIV side by side, COVID, you know, we're at 6.59 million deaths worldwide. It has been terrible. And it started on March 11th, 2020. That's when the pandemic was declared. But HIV has steadily also been going on this whole time. And there are 38.4 million people living with HIV worldwide, 40.3 million deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, I call it a pandemic, WHO calls it an epidemic, but I think it's a pandemic. And essentially, it, these are colliding in a way because what happened during COVID is we had major setbacks to the HIV response. Last year, in 2021, we thought we'd be at about 800,000 new infections over the whole planet. There were 1.5 million new infections, twice as much as projected. There uh, have been 650,000 deaths just last year. And every two minutes, an adolescent girl, young woman is diagnosed with HIV. There were so many school disruptions. There were so many disruptions to girls' lives. And they actually had higher rates of HIV over the last year. And that is globally <clears throat> that the incidence has been so much higher than we thought. And then here in the United States, this is what's been happening. And we don't have that um, good of records, to be fair, in the United States, but um, this is sort of the pandemic across the United States. And what I mean by not as good records is the CDC hasn't updated their data for a couple of years. But as of our latest statistics, if you look across the United States at 1.1 million people living with HIV, you can see this very dramatic um, high prevalence rate in the South and Southeast of this country. And I think that's a really important statistic because these are places with the fewest AIDS doctors, with the fewest uh, Medicaid expansions by governors. And uh, these are places where essentially there's an overlay of poverty. And 
Then this is a map of virologic suppression rates. This is the goal of therapy. You want a lighter, uh, essentially here a lighter area means that you've approached what you want. Um, high rates of virologic suppression and the darker areas again are in the south and southeast. So those are the areas that are faring more poorly. And if we, and again, it is this map of poverty because if you look at poverty in, in these, it represented by these red areas, this is, this, the epidemic is moving towards, as it always has been, a disease of poverty, a disease of social injustice, and 52% um, of the new infections in the United States at this point are in the South and Southeast. So what happened during the pandemic was really essentially that a lot of HIV needs got pushed away because it was a time of just concentrating on COVID and there were four pillars of HIV that got derailed. And I always think of the four pillars as susceptibility, uh, testing, prevention, and treatment. And all four of them got derailed, meaning we saw really quite high STD rates during the pandemic, not at the very beginning, there was a massive lockdown, but then relatively soon, probably in the summer of 2020, STD started going up. So there's clearly increased susceptibility to HIV. There was reductions in testing. We're still down in, in San Francisco with our testing rates. Reductions in people getting pre-exposure prophylaxis and people getting on treatment. And so this is the latest San Francisco, San Francisco statistics. They update this every year. This is the HIV epidemiology surveillance report. and that you can see that HIV testing is still down about 27% um, right now compared to where we were before 2019. So we haven't yet gone back to where we need to be with HIV testing, which may mean that we're not getting all of our diagnoses that we need to. And our virologic suppression rate went down in the city to 75%, but among those who are homeless, it's 27%. So very low rate and very high rates of marginal housing in those who are living with HIV. So um, I want to mention monkeypox. Should yes. I mention it? Yes, you will next. <laughs> yes, let's talk about yes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the thing is, you know, someone like Dr. Mark, there's a lot, of data. There's that, a lot yeah. of data. Yeah, we're going to get to that, but I want to yeah. give a chance for yeah. our three panelists to chime in here on HIV AIDS and, and how, it, you know, during the last few years, uh, the state of it in your respective work, right? This regards to testing, the emergency room, just some of the stuff that you are witnessing. So we'll start with Antoine. Hello, everyone. Initially, when I'm talking about the type of work that I do, I work with Code Tendulance, the director of youth programs. So what I've noticed since with HIV since 2020, um, more initiatives are being developed, thinking about the end of the epidemic, which is uh, initiative all throughout the United States, but in San Francisco, trying to address um, all STIs before the end of um, 2030. So developing social infrastructure, I develop our Empowering Black Youth Program, and really thinking about overdoses as well within the community when we're thinking about not only HIV, because when we talk about HIV and AIDS, it overlaps in many different subjects. Um, so when we're thinking about overdose in San Francisco, Black men between 50 to 65 years old actually increase overdoses over the time since the pandemic. So when we're thinking about other social determinants that affect people living with HIV and also other health disparities, um, what I'm noticing within our work um, in San Francisco, even though it's very progressive, we're still lacking subpopulations within the black community. So when we're thinking about PrEP access, et cetera, it still is lacked within the black community. When we're thinking about medical mistrust, as when we'll get to my slides, we'll talk more about the social infrastructure and thinking about the ability to really address HIV within these communities. So not looking at HIV as one project, but multiple projects. Um, and I think San Francisco is an area that can initially change multiple perspectives throughout a society, it has. And, with HIV, the history of it, when we're thinking about other aspects of research coming out the Bay Area when COVID happened and the Bay Area was the first ones to shut down. So there's a lot of initiatives that can be done, but I think throughout the pandemic as we was worrying, thinking about what is this new um, disease that's out, we forgot about in some aspects to be able to get people in for care for HIV, et cetera. 
So before I started working at Code 10 Lawn, I also uh, used to work at San Francisco Department of Public Health as a case manager. So really working with people who have um, lost care within access since COVID, thinking about housing, um, thinking about financial deficits. Along with that, I used to work at the Glide Foundation from 2018 to 2020, also being an HIV navigator. So really having the understanding of the population, even though I'm from Meridian, Mississippi, moved out here in 2018, but really understanding the lay of the land that uh, the Bay Area has a particular aspect that can be addressed, even though um, San Francisco is great at what it do. We still have Oakland and Alameda County that is also suffering for HIV and AIDS as well. So I'm really thinking about a holistic point of view. Craig. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so Renegade Bio is a diagnostic testing company that started uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, I think one of the really obvious points that came to us through our testing and through our experience was the fact that COVID was affecting people along uh, social, uh, economic, um, racial lines, right? And when we saw that, you know, we, we've seen that before <laughs> with HIV and AIDS, we see it again here. And I think what we have is an opportunity to really address that disparity in a really good way. And I think COVID has led to some really cool innovation and really cool, um, exciting um, uh, mechanisms for delivering care, whether that's telehealth, that's reaching communities that wouldn't traditionally have access to testing or treatment, or whether that's you know novel uh, testing mechanisms, right? And even vaccinology. Um, we've learned through HIV research that vaccines can be created, mRNA vaccines can be created through in vitro transcription, which is the science language. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a scientist. Uh, so um, yeah, I think COVID really opened Renegade Bio's eyes and, and co the culture's eyes around um, how disease impacts people based on social, cultural uh, dividing lines. Um, yeah. I like. I really want to know about this in vitro something something. Because, you know, for an L person of the LGBTQIA class, I'm thinking something else. We're gonna get back. We're, we're gonna get back to that. But um, yeah, Dr. Petra, you know, HIV/AIDS, and in the last uh, like, couple of years. Uh, sure. So to echo everyone's sentiment. Um, so in addition to being the um, CEO of Transclinic, I also practice emergency medicine, so I've been on the front lines pretty much the whole time. And um, as everyone knows, you know, when we were in shelter in place, everyone was, you know, most of the clinics closed. And, you know, generally emergency medicine is used as a primary care for a lot of folks, if not, you know, majority of people. So at least early in the pandemic, you know, if you're having a heart attack, a stroke, appendicitis, anything like that. People stayed at home until the very last minute uh, because they're just afraid to come to the hospital naturally. So certainly HIV testing and you know thinking about those types of things were kind of on the back burner uh, during COVID because everyone was so you know frightened and overwhelmed um, because of the virus. Um, so that's my ER doctor hat. Um, so in terms of the transclinique, I mean, I think that on a positive note, uh, telemedicine has really been wonderful in terms of um, access to care and you can you know, be at home and see a doctor you know, essentially when you want if you uh, So from that standpoint, HIV AIDS, you know, my four or 500 patients that I take care of in terms of the gender affirming clinic, the um, you know, majority of those people are on uh, PrEP and we talk about, have discussions about their, you know, sexual history and things like that. And um, we've gotten a few emergency uh, prep calls and things like that. Mm. So um, so I think that is a positive in terms of the pandemic, in addition to the testing. It's nice to listen to all this. Like, there's some positivity other than the <laughs> doom and gloom. John. Well, Dr. Gandhi, one of your slides uh, was showing the, the states. And the darker they were, the higher the, uh, the incidents were. And of course, as you noted, you know a lot of that congregation was in the South, 
But California was also the darkest color. <clears throat> yes. What, what is, what, what's wrong with us? <laughs> well, nothing, but, um, <laughs> but things got set back. Okay. And, um, you know, San Francisco, like we always say, is the place where it all should happen first. But unfortunately, we did have a higher incidence of HIV last year compared to the year before. It may have been caught up diagnoses. So we were on a downward trajectory, but then we went up last year. So, and we may not, I mean, the homeless, I, I, it's very hard to, uh, at Ward 86, we treat 34% uh, of our patients are homeless. This is the hardest population to be in. How do you like keep your pills? Where are they supposed to be? You don't have a locker. You don't have somewhere to keep them. They're stolen all the time. Um, you don't want to tell people that you have HIV. It's a really, really hard thing. And we, we actually tried to do telehealth, but we couldn't because um, we we were told to do telehealth. In fact, and then I I didn't as the medical director of Ward 86, and then they, I got in trouble. But I didn't because um, our patients were homeless. They had no private place to call from or they didn't have phones. Yeah. So we just had them come in. We actually had a drop in every day starting from March 17th, which is when we're supposed to close down. And then June, we resumed in-person care for everyone because there's something about, and this is just this particular patient Absolutely. population, but it is there is something about that personal touch and also having social work help them to get temporary housing because we opened up hotels for isolation, for example. Mm -hmm. So. This is a very, this is actually what our problem is. It is, it is three m massive problems that are coming together that make it difficult to take HIV meds. And it's homelessness, it's substance use, which has gone up, and the overdose deaths that we saw at Ward 86 were tragic. And so many, we had so much more overdose deaths than we saw severe COVID because the city was really closed down. So we had very little COVID, we had a lot of overdose mm -hmm. because people relapsed because they were so lonely. They were told 40 years ago to stay away from people sexually, and then they were told for two years just not to breathe around people. Like, it was really lonely. It was so lonely. And so we had a lot of relapses, a lot of overdose. And then the third reason is mental illness, and our rates of depression and anxiety went quite high in our clinic. So I think these are the three overlapping challenges that we have to work on. Mm -hmm. Antoine, when you mentioned the overdose, overdose, it was kind of a concentration for like men 50 to 62 or something like that. 65, so thinking about in the Bayview, um, right outside the main city, part of downtown San Francisco, we have African American men who are overdosing at a higher rate. So um, San Francisco Department of Public Health actually released data and said it was over 410%. So when we're thinking about a percentile, if we're at up at that amount when San Francisco black population is only 6%, along with when we're thinking about women, men, children, the man black population is probably like 2%. So we're making up over 410% of the percentage of overdoses in that age range, thinking about the lack of resources that are in the Bayview compared to downtown in this area or thinking about Ward 86, so transportation lacks, the infrastructure lacks to get people from Bayview and other areas. Um, the Bayview and other areas, so basically that's one of the populations that really has, along with people experiencing homelessness, along with people who identify as trans and non-binary, these are still issues that are affecting subpopulations that don't necessarily always reflect San Francisco. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to get into infrastructure a little later on in the program and, and talk about how all four of these individuals here on this panel address the gaps um, in the infrastructure. But before we get to that, let's turn our attention to some other things that popped up. <laughs> this was a surprise. Monkey Monkeypox. Pox. This was a surprise. So this has now been relabeled MPOX by the WHO. Um, but, you know, Actually, what usually MPOX does, just to remind ourselves, because there's so much virus out there now, or for the word virus, everyone thinks about viruses too much, but there's really, the way to remember what kind of virus it is, is it's a DNA virus, and then SARS-CoV-2, which we've heard a lot about, is an RNA virus, so it's the genetic material that it carries, and HIV is both. It starts out as RNA, and then it becomes a DNA virus, and that's called a retrovirus. <coughs> but MPOX has really famous cousins, um, because it's in a very 
small family called the Orthopox virus family, and it has three super famous cousins, which one is smallpox, which got eradicated in 1980 worldwide. Um, and then the second was uh, cowpox and vaccinia, which were both made to, uh, w which were both used to make smallpox vaccines. So um, this was really surprising on May 2nd, though uh, the WHO got a report of this mpox case in a gay man in um, the UK, and he had not traveled to uh, West or Central Africa, and that is actually where it's usually endemic. There are outbreaks of mpox in West and Central Africa, usually associated with rodent exposure, but this was no, there was no rodent exposure. This was a rave. He had been to a rave in Spain. And um, then suddenly we now have 81,000 cases across the world in this outbreak, and it's um, from 110 countries, and mainly it has been among gay and bisexual men. In fact, it's 98 to 99 percent men, so it's a very high percentage of men. And it really now seems to be completely slowing, but this type of epidemiology where you see it more among kind of middle-aged or younger people and mostly skewed towards men, this really was looking like a sexually transmitted disease, which is not how we thought about mpox before this. Um, and then actually Nigerian scientists came out and said, you know what? Homosexuality was criminalized here, and yes, it was happening in gay men. We were just not going to announce that. So it likely did have that method of transmission prior to this, but um, it's, it can be rarely spread by close contact, and there, and there definitely have been some women um, who've gotten infected, but it, it's mainly been a male epidemic. And uh, the cases are absolutely slowing. We in California are still the highest number of cases, but they're absolutely slowing, California and then New York. And, uh, but cr looking across the country, it started out more in white men, then it went to black men and Latino men, and now it really is more predominantly in racial and ethnic minorities. And 41% of people who have had MPOX have HIV, which is not, um, which is surprising, in, except for the fact that we've never had an orthopox virus and HIV exist at the same time in human history. Because smallpox was gone by 1980, and uh, HIV got described in 1981. So there's something about those two that they find each other. And there's also a lot of STD, other STDs that can come along with MPOX. So I do think it's an STD. I think it should, personally, I think it should be reclassified as an STD which it has been in New York City because then you get resources from that, um, from those departments and beyond that minors can get treated without um, telling their parents. So there's good reasons I think to reclassify it and, be and we knew that there was viable virus in, in anal and urethral swabs so it seems to be more um, in men. And uh, the vaccine totally changed everything. I mean, there was probably, um, people had fewer of these parties and all that, but it wasn't just that. It really was the vaccine. And the thing, way to think about the vaccine is we just had a ready-made vaccine because we didn't have to invent one because smallpox vaccine worked against mpox. And there are huge reserves of smallpox vaccine because the US gives it to the military. In fact, they had just destroyed 20 million doses before this happened, which I wish they hadn't. So this vaccine really was the vaccine to use again at MPOX, and it was distributed quite widely. And now this is what the curves are looking like. On the left is the US, and on the right is worldwide. And starting the third week of August, all the cases started coming down. It was like precipitous because of all the immunity. And really, we're going to be able, well, the WHO does think it will be eliminated in the UK, US, Canada, Australia, because it never got into animal populations. Unfortunately, West and Central Africa still has it and they need vaccine. Um, and we've given out in the US um, plenty of doses, but not enough, because I always think of, okay, anyone who needs PrEP should get genius vaccine for mpox, and that's 1.2 million people, men and women, and then um, all men with HIV should get the genius vaccine. And if you add that up, it's about 3.2 million doses, and about 1.4 million doses have been given out. So I think we still need to give out more genius vaccine. And um, essentially, this also leads to the fact that it wasn't just mpox, but other STDs, syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, went up pretty soon, not right around the beginning of the pandemic, but then pretty soon thereafter. And they are, they are raging, they are happening. So these are other reasons to worry um, and to think about treatment and to think about like turning our attention to all of these treatments. And one very big deal is taking doxypep, which is a... Um, 
a prophylactic way to prevent um, your, you from getting um, syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea by taking a pill after sex. And this has just happened. Doxypep study just got released, and it's very exciting, and we're starting it in San Francisco. It's, it's only been um, shown to have effectiveness right now in men who have sex with men, but it's a big deal. And so this is going to be rolled out in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. So I'll, yeah, end there. Thank you. All right. There's a lot there. And I know uh, <laughs> several of our panelists want to chime in here. We'll start with Dr. Petra. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's hard to follow that up. You know? <laughs> but and so I would just say that um, anecdotally, it's very interesting that you mentioned that it should be classified as a sexually transmitted disease. And think about why is the LGBT community, and I can you know speak about the trans community um, pretty well, but um, you know, the more likely that those uh, that community is polyamorous um, compared to the you know straight or um, sex workers, you know things like that. So much more susceptible and vulnerable. Um, anecdotally, I've known quite a number of people earlier last summer that came down with mpox um, in the trans community, and you know most of those were sex workers or you know had insecure housing and things like that. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Mm. Craig. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I worry about an orthopox virus being classified as a sexually transmitted disease um, just because we saw the response sort of vary based on which communities were affected and how the rollouts were sort of prevented and how um, even access to testing was sort of withheld um, or gate kept, I should say in a way that wasn't as open as COVID testing, for example. Um, I think there's so much stigma that comes along with identifying a sexually transmitted disease within a population. And that's not to say we brush it under the rug and ignore, ignore the, the truth there. But I think, it's, um, I think it's important to say this is one route of transmission. This is how we address this route of transmission. And so much of that was behavioral change within the LGBTQ community. Like, OK, this is a virus that's affecting our community specifically. We can change our behavior to get there. Um, it wasn't necessarily prophylaxis or preventative measures that were doing the work. It was behavior change coupled with the availability of a vaccine, which is moderately efficacious. Um, so I would. Yeah, I would have to push back on that. Please a little do. Bit. Yeah, Please I'm do. just gonna say, because <laughs> the, the reason. I mean, I actually think it's good public health to identify the community most at risk. So there are three STDs: herpes, syphilis, and molluscum contagiosum that can rarely spread by other ways. So remember herpetic Whitlow, like we learned about this in medical school, that if you touched a herpes lesion, that you could get it on your finger as a healthcare worker. Mm -hmm. We used to not um, glove when we did genital exams. And so a lot of healthcare workers had syphilis on their fingers. These are mostly STD spread, but rarely by other means. And um, uh, and that is true of, of, of MPOX as well. It can spread like by cuddling, like small young children. There were about 56 children who got diagnosed in the US. But the reason to, I, I think, um, I just think it's, I, I think it's good public health to say who the community's most at risk so that when there are limited resources, that those resources can go to those communities like the Genius vaccine. And, um, and also, you can't, as a minor, go and get treatment if it's not been classified as an STD. And that's an issue for LGBTQ youth. And then the final thing I would want to say about the vaccine is it's not, I don't think it's moderately efficacious. It's probably 87% effective at least. This is data from Zimbabwe um, uh, prior to this MPOX outbreak that that, that the fundamental reason why we think it's so effective is we didn't actually see MPOX in humans until we had stopped mass, uh, mass vaccination programs for smallpox. We stopped it in 1972 in this country. Maybe some of you will remember have gotten your smallpox vaccine. But we stopped in 1970, early 70s in this country, 1979 in Africa. And it was only give it, it was basically a generation where the vaccine you know, wore off, people didn't get the vaccine. And then we started seeing mpox outbreak. So I think it's actually quite effective. And it's been um, so, but I, I agree that there was behavior change. But I think that I'll give a good example. Like, 
I spoke a lot about schools during COVID and schools being open. And the reason I did that is because older people are more at risk for COVID than younger, uh, for, than children for severe disease. In the same way, saying that gay men are most affected by, they were most affected by this infection doesn't seem stigmatizing to me. It seems empowering. It was this community that took responsibility and called the White House and said, get us the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And why do you throw away 20 million doses, by the way? And like, they were just so great and advocating. As, so I'll just give that counterpoint. Yeah, yeah, I know. I think that's, I think that's <laughs> great. Okay. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Thank you. I, I think that's really great. I think, um, you know, I we have a different experience <laughs> yeah. of, of that whole situation. And I think that, um, from a public health perspective, um, there was stigma in in identifying and even reaching reaching those resources. Getting to those resources was really problematic, and we don't we don't need to rehash it. Everyone does the best they can, and it was a pandemic inside a you know or a, a outbreak inside of a pandemic. It was a very difficult situation, and everyone did what they could to to end it. And I think that's important. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> no, no. There's more to come on that because you all, you know, rose to the occasion in different ways in which you, in, in a lot of ways you had no choice because you care about the community. Um, so we're going to get there. But I want to give Antoine a chance to chime in here on, on STDs, MPOX, STIs, and then, you know, just kind of how that affected your work uh, with regards to the pandemic. Um, initially, I do think the marketing strategy for any STIs talking about people living with HIV or people who might be um, dealing with monkeypox, et cetera, sometimes does come off with this certain air about itself. It seems like it's marketed towards certain people. So I think the language that initially drives these paradigms, along with us trying to market and tell other people, because the first thing people were saying when it was about... Um, monkeypox for men sleeping with men, it was like, oh, that's a gay disease, or oh, that's a gay this, or that's a gay that. And initially we had women, we had children, et cetera, uh, who also was contracting it. So I think sometimes with the marketing piece, regardless if it's monkeypox or HIV, you never really know, like, what's the strategy? Sometimes when I look at, like, um, HIV marketing aspects, it seems like it's geared towards a certain population that is black and gay. Um, to think that all of us might be feminine, to think that all of us might be trans or non-binary or masculine, to just assume this characteristic about identities, I think initially does tend to harm the scientific approach. So when we're thinking about the larger narrative of trying to get more people involved, when you're marketing and making it seem like, oh, HIV is just, a gay man disease, AIDS is just gonna affect um, gay men. But now we see that African-American women are now leading in certain cases when it comes to cis women, when they're living with HIV. We're thinking about like uh, herpes, actually that's one of the top STIs in California, but we don't necessarily talk about it. People don't, how, don't know how to get tested for it if they don't necessarily have outbreaks. Um, thinking about syphilis, how that's spread amongst like people who use the substances. Thinking about like even though hepatitis C is not curable, I was actually at Brown University at that time when that came out in 2015, so I was pretty stoked about that. But just really thinking about accessibility, treatment, and where we're going in the future, I really think I'm very hopeful and. Maybe like I think the biggest piece is marketing. So how we come out and talk about this. Uh, let it be more of a conversation than just here's the data because then everyone else runs with this narrative and they create those narratives to become whatever they want it to be. As we know, pseudo-facts, et cetera, has been big for the past few years. So making sure that we as people who have like a platform, we really using like our voice to once again shift those constructs. I just want to remind the audience here in the room there are some audience question cards uh, throughout the room. If you've got a question, go ahead and write it down. I'll get down off the stage in a little while and collect some, and we'll have them for toward the end of the program. Actually, but, sorry, John. I think we do have a volunteer. In the oh, back. do we? Yeah, who's willing oh, to great. grab if, them for us? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and so it looks like we, we already have some cards coming up. So, all right. You let's saved me a trip from the stage. I love it. Okay. <laughs> go why, ahead. why don't you go ahead? All right. What's, what's the plan? How do we address all this and especially, you know, going forward? 
we'll start with Dr. Gandhi because I know you got some slides. Well, um, <laughs> so I, I think that we can address each of these pillars. So susceptibility, access to counseling, prep, you can, and, and it sounds like prep has been great in Transclinique, and we have also tried to expand prep as much as we can right now. We like the intramuscular cabotegravir because it's so easy to do every two, every eight weeks, which is a different form of prep that just came out, just a shot every eight weeks. We're totally getting into this in, in both, um, in, in, in across um, a gender. And then uh, substance use treatment, because we, have to work harder on our substance use treatment. There are actually some very good treatments for more of the opiate class. And then testing ERs in urgent care feels like the place should, to test for HIV. Like, you know, because like you said, they became the primary care mm -hmm. setting. And so urgent care, especially a lot of people are going to, into urgent care and anywhere that someone can think of and someone sees them, they should be getting HIV tested because the guidelines actually say everyone should be HIV tested if they're risk factors once a year. And then mobile vans for PrEP and giving out 90-day supplies and using the intramuscular one. And then the same with um, treatment. We had to expand treatment. So we are, we are trying all four of those. I think the city got worried um, when what happened is last year this time, it was around World AIDS Day, it was also the first time that Omicron variant was detected in the US. It was 12-1-2021. And um, we actually went and marched on the, the streets of City Hall and said, take back HIV. And then all these news came and they said, wait, why are you talking about this? It's Omicron. And we said, no, but this is the 40 year anniversary of the first description of AIDS because it was <laughs> June 5th, 1981 was that you know, first case reports of AIDS in the, in the CDC. And so it was the 40th anniversary of it, and we really wanted to talk about HIV that day. The news definitely didn't want to talk about HIV that day, and so we started a movement called Take Back HIV and really lobbied with the city, and this was the Harvey Milk Democratic Club and other groups, and um, got some more money for HIV put into HIV testing and HIV treatment, but I think we need to go further. So. Um, we restored in-person in care at Ward 86, and we saw our rates of virologic suppression go up. But I think the biggest thing we did was the pop-up clinic, at least at Ward 86, which is a drop-in for homeless patients. It means no appointments. There's no 4 o'clock on Tuesday. That's good. Like, you are in a tent. You don't need to have a time. You just can come in any time you want. And then the same team gathers around you, the same provider, social worker, nurse, pharmacist, and does primary care, does HIV care gives vaccines, and pop-up has been successful in the sense that our virologic suppression rates are higher than the cities. It's about 60%. It isn't 90, but it's 60% in the pop-up program. And the WHO at this point is essentially saying, with COVID, we have to live with COVID. We do have to live with COVID. It's just a non-eradicable virus for lots of reasons. Just even one is that 29 <coughs> species of animals carry it. So the only eradicated virus that we've ever had is smallpox. Um, and it had zero animal reservoirs. There's also a cattle virus called winter pest, but they shot all the cattle so that we're not doing that. So there's, it's, it's, you know, it's not an eradicable virus. And because of that, the way to live with it is vaccination and therapeutics. And, um, and what they did on the 30th of March is said, let's downgrade from the emergency response because there was a lot of setbacks in HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, everything else have a plan where everyone gets vac everyone gets boosted once a year who's older or vulnerable. If we get a worse variant, God forbid, we'll all get boosted. And if we get a, best, a better variant, then probably that would cause a boost worldwide. And they have a whole plan to emerge from this. And I think that's fair because their point is that these setbacks are also important in HIV and TB and everything else. So that is the plan. That's supposed to be the plan of the United States as well. Try to Try to work on these other infections. Let's open up to our other speakers. What's what's the plan? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Petra. Oh, sure. Well, I'm really, <laughs> definitely really proud to be very resident and all these you know, amazing people and technologies. And, you know, I've lived and worked in other places in healthcare. And, you know, I think we need to continue to be the beacon of and the forefront of, of care for, you know, whether it be, you know, minorities um, of any type. And, so uh, my plan in my little space is telemedicine, of course, and, and I think that's um, 
definitely uh, accessibility is uh, tremendous capabilities. And I think out of the pandemic, that's one amazing thing that happened. And um, so in my space, I'm gonna continue to do that. I'm gonna try to open it up and offer as much uh, free care as possible, you know, with uh, funding, but we'll see. Craig. Yeah, I think, you know, one of our learnings with COVID was meeting, that meeting people where they are is really where you can make a difference. And, you know, with our prep and STI programs, we're really focused on sort of leveraging um, the power of community networks to reach the people that need access to HIV prevention and testing diagnostics and downstream treatment, but also using that as an entry point into healthcare, right? So through our community partners, we can work to enroll the uninsured in Medi-Cal. We can un, you know, enroll folks in CalFresh and create the stability, the housing stability, the, the general stability that is required to maintain a prevention program or a treatment program. Angela. Um, I think cross-collaboration amongst community members, nonprofits, uh, research and academic institutions along with government entities will have to continue to find ways and I feel like in the past two years we have found better ways to cross collaborate and get like the perspective of the community what's needed here um, different initiatives being created to really address social determinants at large we have political figures who start to be a little more engaged with understanding like what needs to be done when we're thinking about like homelessness right now. So when I think these different components um, throughout the past two years, I feel the amount of um, collaboration amongst all entities are going to have to be something that people understand and also knowing that um, it's okay when the black community or in the trans community or thinking about the gay community is speaking for their community. Sometimes we overlap within that identity, uh, but being okay with knowing to step up and when to step back, because some aspects you're not gonna be able to go into my community and work directly with black people who might not trust the medical system. You might have to get people who look more like them, who are also scientists, who also believe in them, who also want to like mobilize and make society better um, to be the front runners for that community and having to be okay with that narrative. Absolutely. I think we'll open it up to questions. Sure. And this is addressed for Dr. Gandhi, but after, if anyone else wants to pitch in as well, um, the audience member asked if you could talk a bit about doxypep versus doxyprep uh, and its impact on the microbiome and antibiotic resistance. I just said a whole bunch of words I don't understand. <laughs> no, Maybe that's could. so important though. That's such a good question. Because the, so what it is, is really doxycycline seems to, um, you know, have activity against intracellular organisms and chlamydia and gonorrhea <clears throat> and the treponemes. It works against all of them and syphilis is a treponeme. So it, it's really not PrEP, it's actually PEP. It's really post-exposure prophylaxis. And the design of the study was, um, after you have sex and there's, it was in only, it's only been done, it hasn't looked at um, cisgender women, it's only been done in a pretty small group of uh, transgender women and a larger group of MSM. And in that group, if you take it after sex, within 24 hours, but preferably like two hours, and then take it again and then again every time you have sex, so it's kind of like post, it's after. Um, there was a 67% reduction in all three of these STDs, but it's such a good question of this audience member <laughs> because a lot of people are pushing back on this and saying, well, I'm worried about the impact on the microbiome. I'm, imp I'm worried about the impact on Staph aureus, um, resistance to doxycycline, which actually doxycycline we do use. Uh, doxy a lot if there's MRSA, which is methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So that is a very astute question. And in fact, there's, um, 
there's the, the, the study is supposed to be examining the microbiome and, and, and sequencing it and seeing if, if there is resistance for other organisms. But the reason that San Francisco is rolling it out is their point is, well, people were going to get doxy if they got these infections, and this is a way to stop it, and they would have gotten a longer course if they got the infection. So maybe it'll all even out, and we're not going to use that much more doxy. That's the hope. Any, anyone want to add? I actually yeah, have a question, <laughs> because that's a very scientific yeah, question. It I love is. it. Um, so what is, what is the regimen for doxypep? Is it a um, long term? Like taking it once seems like you would give a dose enough to teach some bacteria how to be immune. I know. It's, I know, but it is that way. It is, it's 200 milligrams. It's not 100. Okay. And it's taking it every time if you continue sex and like you keep on doing it every day but if you like say no two weeks without sex you stop it so you're right you're worried you're kind of implicating that sometimes if you have a little bit of antibiotic that's when drug selective pressure happens that's right so that is the worry i mean it's really interesting the id world right now is really split you can see the std people are like are super excited about this and then people who do inpatient like treatment of MRSA, they're mad. They're really worried. Hmm. So there's a big split in the ID right now. Like there's like people kind of fighting about this. So I don't know. I hope I hope not though. I hope it won't. Yeah. Cause this resistance. <laughs> awesome. But you you put your finger on the pulse of it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, someone else asks about really the, that. So long COVID. What's our current understanding of it? How does that impact what? all of you is, are working on um, and do we know enough about how you know it seems we still are learning different you know every month or so you'll see another article come out that uh, kind of shows that it's a little bit different than we thought so what's the latest we know about long COVID and how does it impact these other uh, uh, diseases and viruses that we're talking about you're the doctors. <laughs> to me, it just kind of models you know, symptomatology, you know, in terms of, you know, similar to someone that comes in with kind of vague uh, weakness or pains, or you know, similar to like a lupus or a Lyme disease. So it just it just kind of makes it, um, you know, the differential diagnosis longer and more difficult, and you don't know if it's. Actually, you know, you don't. <laughs> the origin of it is difficult to say, and I don't. From my understanding, there's not enough information or data out there to prove one way or the other. But I think it's definitely a thing from patients I've seen. You know, six months later, they get a mysterious blood clot, or you know, just weakness. Um, you know, used to be an athlete, and now they're you know essentially bedridden or you know very depressed, things like that. So I think it. You know, from my point of view, it just makes it more challenging. I, mean, I think oh. one thing is the incidence has gone down. Um, and I think that's a relief. And the reason it's gone down is it seemed to be so much more associated with severe disease. Like people, which we always knew that severe influenza or severe other respiratory pathogens could cause a lingering syndrome. We saw that. And as severe disease has gone down, We've seen less and less. There was a paper in Journal of Internal Medicine yesterday that looks like it's now at a prevalence of 1%. And at one point, it was like 1 in 5. Mm. So that's because we see so much less severe disease, which is a relief. Mm. And then it doesn't mean that those 1%, like, shouldn't still, you know, we need better treatments. And there is no real treatment. You have to rule out everything else, like you said. Mm. We need to make sure it's not something else. People have gotten cancer, missed, and other things. Right. So from a uh, immunological perspective, I wonder what like T cell exhaustion looks like um, and how that impacts um, the comorbidity of HIV and long COVID. Um, I don't have the answer. I'm wondering if you do. <laughs> well, it's really interesting because this has been bandied about like that COVID destroys your T cells, but like, actually any severe infection can cause reduction of T cells anything severe, like terrible flu, terrible other respiratory pathogens. There was just a JAMA article that actually people had longer symptoms during this time, 
if it wasn't COVID in the hospital and it was another respiratory pathogen than if it was SARS. So that just proves that it really is any respiratory pathogen. But it doesn't stay around like HIV does and keep on hurting your T cells. I mean, HIV, unfortunately, will keep on hurting your T cells and, and trying to destroy them unless you can get on treatment. And then, of course, what treatment does is stopping it from destroying your T cells. If you're not on treatment, it will, it will keep on bringing the T cells down. So mild COVID doesn't seem to do this. And I think that's tremendously important because about 75% of this country has seen COVID. There's a model from um, IHME in Seattle that probably 75% of the planet at least has seen COVID. When you say, I'm sorry, when you say this. Has, has had been infected with COVID. I think there are very few, like very 25% of the population, and it may even be lower now, has not had COVID. Mm. So, um, but it's been mostly mild since um, the vaccines and since population immunity has gone on and we haven't seen the symptoms like we did at the beginning of the pandemic with long COVID, yeah. which is severe. Great, thank you. Anything else? All right, well, that brings us to our very last question. We got about, uh, well, uh, five minutes left or so. Um, and we're gonna pass a clicker on over to Antoine because it's the question of infrastructure. I mean, you know, Antoine had brought it up and it, all of you, I'd love for you to answer that question in terms of how you rise to the occasion under all this chaos, but that has lead to a positive outcome. You've all have mentioned it like, you know, we've gotten past the doom and gloom. We're getting to a place in which we are getting some of the information faster. Uh, testing is, you know, might be much more available. Are we knowing that testing is a big, huge part of this whole thing, right? Especially at the onset of any new virus. It feels like we're, we're starting to get the, the gist of it and hopefully uh, not have to go through what we went through in the last few years. So we'll begin with Antoine and your slides and talking about infrastructure. All right. Um, so initially, with me graduating from Tougaloo College in biology and also studying at Brown University, also studying immunology and microbiology as well, um, I didn't necessarily like the laboratories, but I did enjoy really trying to figure out how to use a scientific perspective to really address social uh, outcome. So once I graduated in 2018, I came out here to the Bay Area, fell in love. I was like, I'm not going back home and just stay. Um, so basically what I noticed within this time, um, we have a lack of social infrastructure that allows black communities and brown communities to engage in community participatory research. So really allowing the community to come up with designs that really affect or provide solutions to address social determinants. Uh, regardless if that's in public, sexual, reproductive, or population health. Um, creating programs within organizations that incentivize with an array of resources. So oftentimes we think about programs, you know, you might get them a job or you might give them $25 gift cards, uh, but really being intentional about the population that you work with, what you can provide. So can you provide a stipend? How much of the stipend can you provide? Can you provide DoorDash cards? Can you provide like a, um, vouchers for them to eat? Finding ways to pay for their hotels. So really getting that bob and being innovative when we're thinking about incentivizing the population. Uh, programs allowing community members to gain skill sets. So not only working with people who you know, we do a workshop and then at the end of the workshop, no one gets anything from it, but really designing programs that allows um, the individuals, once they finish that program, they actually have qualitative, quantitative, they have a training aspect that they can do to enhance their careers, et cetera. Uh, a need for nonprofits and stakeho uh, stakeholders collaboration. So as I said earlier, thinking about community members, nonprofits, how nonprofits are oftentimes the voices for the communities that they serve. But when they are speaking to the mayor's office, when they're speaking to San Francisco, when they're thinking about the city attorney, et cetera, uh, UCSF, Stanford, Berkeley, wherever that allows these different aspects, we need a collective understanding. Along with what I think about the type of work that I do, I kind of um, overlap in the Renaissance. So I think about like Renaissance 2.0. Um, initially, writing is a critical aspect. So I'm also an author talking about different issues related to homelessness, 
um, black youth in the Bay Area, also working on sexual health and reproductive health. And initially, this is some of my work, so I am also a health slash social consultant. Um, you can go to my website if you all want to see it later. But I created within me being a consultant and understanding that consultants are actually key components and players to really design the programs that really reflect to incentivize the community. Um, therefore, I created the Director of Youth Programs at Code Tenderloin, focusing on our Empowering Black Youth Program, which is a 17-week STEM program allowing direct engagement with black youth ages between 13 and 24. What's so unique about that? It's a collective internship. Most of the time, internships are solo. You do projects on your own, etc. But these students focus on multimedia content. Uh, we received a grant from San Francisco Department of Public Health in the epidemic, along with other funders this year with uh, San Francisco Human Rights Commission and Gilead Foundation, along with the Miranda Lex Foundation. Um, 38 different weekend workshops from 10 to 2, um, focusing on sexual and reproductive health, mental and behavioral health, biology, biochemistry, public health, and structural racism. Cohort 1, 2021, they actually develop public health toolkits by learning how to code to make their own word searches, also thinking about brochures and different arts, uh, art software. This year, they also created short films, we actually were able to work with 10 interns, so a array of students from seventh grade to seniors in high school, to our fellows, which we worked with three. Um, and we were able to pay our interns $8,000 a piece. So imagine being 13, uh, receiving $8,000. Um, and then our fellows, we paid them $10,000. We also provided them iPads, keypads, Apple Care to address technology accessibility and also over $8,000 in DoorDash cards. Next year, we actually have our interns going to be developing a podcast, and our five fellows will be developing a manuscript for the EBY program, which we received funding from UCSF um, Echo Community Funds. So when we're thinking about these different initiatives, as I was stating, when we're looking at government, when we're looking at nonprofits, when we're looking at the community, how can we continue to create programs on this caliber to not just say, oh, well, we gave them $1,000, but really being able to amplify our movements. Awesome, awesome, amazing, amazing. We'll just save our applause for last, of course, because there's a whole lot more work we're gonna go through. Craig. Oh, what, what? <laughs> the, question, <laughs> the question of infrastructure and filling in oh, the gaps. I mean, yeah. you mentioned a little bit, you know, of it, which is right, like uh, getting be, becoming that point of access for healthcare. Because our biggest downfall during this whole thing was inaccessibility. But tell us a little bit more about your yeah. work in bridging the gap. Yeah, I think um, really looking, like I said, you know, we, we have a prep program that we're launching at Renegade Bio that is specifically designed to reach communities that need access. We're a public benefit corporation. Our mission is to reach people where they are, to deliver that care to them where they are, and then to also offer training opportunities for people interested in the clinical sciences from a laboratory side. Um, for us, it's the education piece is just as much as important as the diagnostic and treatment piece. If you know your body, if you know what's going on in your body, uh, if you're made aware of scientific language to describe what's going on in your body, you're, you're more able to advocate for your own health care. Um, and that's really what I see as, as you know, having an opportunity to it, provide an access point for education, for understanding, and for really, you know, that medical autonomy that I think we all want and need. Um, so at uh, transclinique.com, <laughs> <laughs> we're in 26 states, and um, basically offering gender-affirming care to a lot of people who wouldn't uh, necessarily be able to have that at all. So, you know, living in a city in, you know, in San Francisco, West Hollywood, things like that, you know, it's you know, you take it for granted a lot of times. Um, you know, earlier in the day, I've, um, you know, started uh, with four people, two in Alabama, two in Louisiana, trans men, I think they were, um, 
on hormones and you know, literally cried. They cried after the appointment and it was not because <laughs> they were mad at me, but it was because you know, they never imagined that they could be able to have that um, care. And you know, they were a couple hours outside of the city of, uh, a couple in Louisiana, a couple in Alabama, but um, essentially on Tuesday nights, we provide uh, educational one hour piece um, talks, a lot of gender affirming specialists, uh, generally, um, you were a guest speaker, I <laughs> believe, recently. And um, so it just creates a space and creates a community. And like I said, it's, um, you know, the accessibility since the pandemic um, is one thing that's very positive that came out of all this. And Dr. Goni. Well, <clears throat> what we're doing um, really has around this long acting uh, treatment and prep because there are people who um, it's so hard to take the pill every day because of all the reasons that we talked about before, especially homeless. And the way that uh, the clinical trials were designed to say, oh, can you give um, long acting treatment for HIV? Is it everyone had to be suppressed and have a house? And of course they had to have access to food and like that's how clinical trials are designed. And so the package in sort of these medications say don't use it in someone who hasn't first gotten their viral load down with oral pills and don't even try it. And um, But we, we have been trying it. And so we've been giving it to people who are homeless. We have this one medical student who goes around on a bike and sometimes gives it to them in their SROs, in the single residency occupancy hotels. And we have have now about 160 people on long acting treatment. And they are not the people who look like who are in the clinical trials, but they are doing really well um, because it was hard to take a pill every day. And now we're gonna expand that to long acting prep. Um, so it's, I, it, there, it's like everything is 1.0, like this was long acting treatment is great, but it actually has to be given every four to eight weeks. And there's gonna be one that comes out on December 27th. It's um, being reviewed by the FDA. That's gonna be every six months, Lena Kapavir. Um, and so uh, it needs to be paired with something, but ultimately we're gonna get to a point where you give like treatment twice a year or prevention twice a year and it's gonna be big. So we, we're working within all these kind of miracles of modern science to bring it to to a pretty poor population. Michelle promised we were going to end on a good, on an up note, and I think you just accomplished that. <laughs> this has been so amazing, and that's that's it. You know, even for a standard civilian like myself, um, <laughs> trying to get through life, that you know we have these thought leaders, and the, thank you to the Commonwealth Club of California for bringing these thought leaders together to be able to share that light at the end of the tunnel and and thanks to all of you for all the work that you do even through the i don't want to say dark times but definitely <laughs> challenging times and so another round of applause for our speakers dr monica gandhi dr alexis petra craig ruski and antoine matthews Thank you to all of you who have joined us here at the club for the end of the uh, end of the year program for the Michelle Miao Show. But like I said, don't worry, I'll be right back in the beginning of the year. Uh, I am, I am, I am Michelle Miao. And if you're new to the program, the Michelle Miao Show is. <laughs> Your A through Z covering the LGBT, LM, NOP, and everyone in between. We touch social justice issues with an intersectional approach. So if you'd like more information for upcoming events, you can head to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to John because I think he's like really relieved that I was able to land that <laughs> after this whole year. Well, like her name wasn't uh, uh, obvious <laughs> enough on the screen. Um, you know what? We also want to thank Gilead Sciences for their support for the Michelle Miao Show and for tonight's program. And all of you here are going to be able to enjoy some food and, and drink and entertainment thanks to Transclinique tonight. So. so Thank you to them. And Renegade Bio. And Renegade Bio. I am so sorry. So also yeah. for their support for the program. So uh, thanks for coming, and please enjoy uh, the next hour out in our lounge. Well, wait, did you mention that there's entertainment? That's when I said entertainment. I mean, that, I, I just said the code just, word of entertainment to mean there would be entertainment. I just wanted to emphasize. All right, get some food, get some drinks. The entertainment is coming. Don't go anywhere. Probably <laughs> well, not to feel it.
aiming just for you. <laughs> we'll see you next year.